How does trauma affect the course of one's entire life? From a young age, Jeff Wallace could see his future path with total clarity. Someday he'd go to prison. He'd be tested there and would discover what he was made of. At 17, Jeff Wallace was tried as an adult and sentenced to 11 years in prison. The trauma Jeff faced behind bars like acts of violence from guards and from other incarcerated residents and the challenge of transitioning from his years in prison shaped his life in ways he didn't expect. Jeff is now focused on studying the effects of the criminal justice system policies and procedures on at-risk youth. Listen in as Jeff and I talk about the challenges of pre-existing traumas, new traumas, and how our identities take shape. Let's dive into the conversation. I'm so glad to have you here today, Jeff. I've been looking forward to this conversation ever since the first time we talked. Uh, let's start with a little bit about your background. Anything you want to share as a general overview for listeners? Absolutely. I think the first thing that I'll sort of uh, describe is the fact that I'm actually um, a resident of the state of Iowa. That's where I grew up at. And um, and growing up there, I pretty much grew grew up in a, and you wouldn't think about this when you're thinking of Iowa, but in a, a pretty poverty-stricken sort of environment. Um, my household was altogether eight people, uh, mm-hmm. three bedroom. So it was very cramped quarters. Um, and for, um, I would say, for years, I thought that uh, not for resale was a brand name rather than something that was given out by the government to people who were underneath the poverty uh, poverty line. So I grew up in Iowa. Um, currently, um, and as we talk more and more about sort of um, – you know, my background and about my insight and things I've sort of been through, I'll discuss more about um, what my background led me to uh, before we, uh, and be a part Before of, we yeah. go to that, I'm going to go back to Iowa for a second. I want to capture some of this. When most people think of Iowa, they think of fields of soybeans and, um, you know, corn and just very rural I actually lived in Iowa for three years. It's where I got a master's degree. So I know that there, it's not just all farmland, but can you paint a picture when you say I grew up in Iowa? Where are we talking about? And what, what was the scenario? So I grew up in the uh, Davenport, Iowa, which is the Mississippi Valley area. And so it's right next to some on the border of Illinois uh, and so the you have Davenport, Bettendorf, that's on the Iowa side, and then Rock Island, Moline, East Moline, Silvis, Milan, that's on the Illinois side. We're about two hours from Chicago. We are about, um, I would say about six hours or so from St. Louis. And so we have a um, environment where you sort of have a lot of influence from those in, those those larger cities. Mm-hmm. And um, my Iowa was definitely a lot different probably than what other people have mm-hmm. seen when they think of Iowa and American Gothic and the, the picture of the, 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 the farmer with the pitchfork and the wife. Yeah, exactly yeah. what I was thinking. And, yeah, and describe your fields, Iowa. <laughs> in the rolling fields of um, Grant Wood's uh, artwork, right? And so mm-hmm. for, um, for me, and I'm going I'm to jump ahead a little bit because this will actually paint, paint the picture the best way. Okay. And um, and that is when I did think of Iowa years later, I would have someone describe it to me as the acronym for the Institute of White America. Hmm. That's what it meant. Hmm. And and that's for a variety of reasons that we'll get into a little later on. But but yeah, so when you so that's exactly what it is. We're black people are six percent of the population. We're about 40 percent of those who get incarcerated. And um, there's a saying that people come here on vacation and they leave on probation. Mm. So Iowa, even though that the amount of people that are underneath the poverty line, um, there is still a lot. And and there is a overwhelming amount Mm. of people underneath the poverty line that are disproportionately amongst those who are black and brown. Uh, So it's definitely a place where you grow up and in our criminal justice world, we call it a nomi which is basically normlessness. You, you grow up in a place where everything that you think um, is normal isn't normal when you go out into the community. The way that we 
um, look at money, the way that we um, view the world, the way that we, for example, um, corporal punishment uh, was something that was pretty normal, you know, in growing up. But then when you look at the other environments, the, the predominantly the, the white affluent, that is not something that you really hear about. So, mm -hmm. so my growing up was one where there's a lot of hand-me-downs because I'm the youngest of, uh, of five brothers and I have one younger sister. And so that means that a lot of times I'm going to school um, with clothes that, you know, of my, that have holes in them. I, um, mm -hmm. I'm going yep. to school sometimes, um, not necessarily prepared, just because there's a lot of hectic stuff going on in the environment where there's eight people mom, right. dad, right. the five of us fellas, and then a younger sister in a three bedroom duplex. So. Mm -hmm. And you're one of the 40% that were yes. incarcerated. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. You know, I, growing up, and this sounds, you know, it sounds pretty, um, it sounds fatalistic, but it's the truth, which is I always knew that I was going to end up incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And it's probably because even growing up, um, my father was actually incarcerated in one of the prison camps in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And um, and he went on to join the Navy at a very young age. Okay, I want to say he was 17. And while in the Navy, he um, he sort of um, he got he got stabbed there. Okay. And then even when he came back up to Iowa, he, he was shot uh, by the police. So, you know, I think that growing mm -hmm. up and listening to some of the stories as a young man, as a young black boy, you always want an yeah. idea of what manhood is. And so for me, the rite of passage, you know, if you're Jewish, it's going to be the bar mitzvah. If you, you know, mm -hmm. if you're Catholic, it's going to be, you know, when you get um, your baptism or whatever. But for, for me, I always knew that my rite of passage of going into manhood for whatever reason uh -huh. was going to be going to, uh, to get locked up. So hmm. I can remember going over to the more affluent um, neighborhood when I was, or city, when I was about eh, 12 years old. And I, me and my brother rode bikes over there. And when we got over there, um, we decided we had this, this plan that we would actually um, steal a bike from the police station. Sounds oh. crazy, but it's, <laughs> that'll it's get what it we done. did. That, yeah. that'll, that'll get her done. I mean, so, was, were they so all here, kind of thinking this is a rite of passage for all of you? I mean, was this uh, you a, know, it, it actually commonly it held? Okay. Well, I say it was and it wasn't because um, in, my, in my family, um, I would say if, you know, there was, there was, yeah, I would say for the most part for the fellas, we, we all at some point got into a little bit of trouble. I okay. But it was myself and, my, and one of my older brothers that got in the most trouble. Okay. Um, but in this particular event, yeah, we actually went there and we started ghost riding, taking the bikes and riding it by itself on the on the side of us to this white affluent neighborhood. Two black children, of course, we get pulled over. So about twelve is when I first started getting put on probation. Mm -hmm. So um, so yeah, I mean, but the people that I chose to hang out with and the people that were just around in my neighborhood, um, yeah, it was just something that we knew was going to happen. We talked mm -hmm. about it, we thought about it, we looked at the people coming back out of prison and jail and we had you know these ideas about him and like hey that's that's a real a man right there man he's he's hard he's he's this he's that and we're trying to capture these mm. images and ideas of what manhood is for for the, for us as young black children wow that's really interesting about the rite of passage so what was the shift that you saw in people you said they would come out and they'd be hard uh, what did you imagine was happening in prison as part of that rite of passage? You know, I think for, for young black boys, our identity is wrapped up so much into manhood because it's something that historically has been taken from us in so many different ways. Uh -huh. We can go all the way back to slavery, to Jim Crow, mm -hmm. on up to even, you know, the ideals of what we think manhood is now based on what we see in, in um, music videos, movies, et cetera. So mm -hmm. for us, we're like, man, we want to be able to make sure that people respect us because that's what it was all about. Okay. Respect us. We have some level of value that we can attract girls. And, and that was like a extension of our manhood. So when we saw people go in and they made it out and they wasn't, we didn't hear about them 
you know, basically folding up or, or telling on someone, then we, in our minds, we're thinking mm. that's what we okay. all need to do because they come out and they're a lot more um, hard than they were when they went in. So when I say hard, I'm saying they were more, um, um, some came out and they had that, what I would call a thousand year, thousand yard glare, which basically yep. they're just looking at, they're just looking, right? Um, some came out, they were still institutionalized. They went right back in. Some came out and um, and they were just like, uh, they glamorized it, you know? And mm. I found out a lot of stuff later on about really what was going on. But the fact that they got back out and we didn't hear bad things about them, everybody mm-hmm. that we uh, sort of hung out with was kind of like, that's just what we're going to end up doing. I mean, of course, we don't wake up saying that, but you have a level of indifference yeah. to that. Yeah. Yeah, you're describing it as almost like a test of, Mm -hmm. you know, can you withstand the pressure, not fold, come out and um, have gone through that, you know, intact. The people that had that thousand yard stare, say more about that. Was that kind of like the classic trauma stare? or Was that the hunted look or what what was that thousand yard stare that you're describing? Well, you know, yeah, I mean, you don't show any level of of weakness by Mm -hmm. showing that you were scared that you were being hunted. It was more of a I'm vacant. I'm more crazy than you. Okay. And some of them just honestly, um, mm. it could have been also because of when I think back on it, as I thought about it in the years, they could have just been what we called up uh, and doing a Thorazine shuffle, which is being over medicated. We, yeah. There's a lot of that that goes yep. on. Um, and I just want to jump back a little bit because sure. one of the reasons why I just felt like this was going to be in my cards is because, you know, going out and, you know, partaking in a lot of different activities, I can remember uh, my first interaction with the police department where it was really rough, which was um, there was a time where um, I would say I was around eh, 11, maybe younger than that. But um, apparently there was a uh, there was something stolen. So they told me to, to come down to the police station. So mm-hmm. I, I'm like, OK, let me get this cleared up. Go down to the police station. I'm not giving them the information that they want. And around 10 or 11 is when they first uh, beat me. And then they sent me out of the police station. And then made me walk all the way home. And I can remember that was one of the first ones. And then not too long after that, I was out doing some things in the middle of the night. And, and I was around the same age, maybe, uh, yeah, about the same age. And uh, maybe 13. And um, and I can remember, you know, I'm, I'm breaking the cars is what I was doing. Obviously, I was doing something I shouldn't have been doing. Mm-hmm. But at some point, there's a group of us, about four of us, and we see the police. We run different directions. I run through a yard on the back of a patio uh, and the policeman, I see him, he looks directly at me, comes up to me. At this point, he's not even chasing me. He puts his gun to my head and, and says to me, I want you to move. I, I Basically, I want to kill you. And I can remember that happening. Mm. You know, having the gun, you know, you can feel it. It's yeah. the heaviness and and it's coldness. And it's like, and he's, and he's, and he's putting it on in my head. And, and that shaped sort of like a us versus them. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. Uh, this is this is only going to get worse. Yeah. And I got to be better, more difficult, and they can't break me. Uh, mentality. Mm. Gotcha. Gotcha. So many who who enter the prison system have pre existing trauma. How do you think that trauma shapes identities, approach to life, and and the ability to trust others? To the point of the story you just shared. Definitely, um, it shapes everything about us and who we are. Mm-hmm. Um, and let me just paint the picture because one of the yeah. things that we that I really want to talk about, especially when we talk about trauma and we talk about what I call anomia, which is that normlessness or that idea that I don't belong here, right? Yeah. When I first got arrested at a young age, I can just distinctly remember I was arrested. I went to the juvenile by a, a white police officer, went to the uh, police station, mostly white police officers. Then I went to the uh, uh, juvenile detention center. And um, and then I go to court and everyone in the court, the judge is white. Um, the people in the background are white. The uh, county attorney is white. The um, the bailiff is white. Everyone is except for my one black mother in the back. Mm. And so um, that in itself sets up an idea of I don't belong here. And that in itself, along with being right. poverty stricken, is traumatizing. So you get yeah. this mentality going in about what your worth is and, and whether or not someone is looking at you a little different because you talk different, you act different, you look different. So yeah, yeah. that in itself makes you start creating a self-fulfilling prophecy of destruction 
of what is it going to take for me to be what my, what I, you know, my dad was, which is, he comes across like a tough guy, you know? Yeah. What is it going to yeah. be for me to be able to do that? Well, we, we know what's next, the next step. And my dad didn't try to do it, but I remember him telling me the stories about, man, this is what we did in prison. This is what happened. This is what happened. And my dad was there, you know, growing up. I mean, he always worked and he always had some type of job doing something, hustle or something or another. But mm-hmm. the, the key is that I remember those stories and I remember thinking to myself, I want to be able to have him look at me the same right. way that, um, that I'm thinking about. With other respect. People. With respect, exactly. Yeah. So when I, so when you come in and you, you, you know, and I'm talking about me, but then we talk about other trauma that shapes people's identities. And um, when you go into these, I, we know that trauma creates a, a level of self-loathing and self-hate sometimes that this festers. And so that creates those self-fulfilling prophecies. Like this is the only thing that's going to happen. Nothing good ever happens. I might as well do mm-hmm. this because who cares? And no mm-hmm. one's going to be there. So I definitely believe that you become your mm-hmm. best victim by running the victim Olympics. And when you do that, it becomes a fresh wound and you don't know how to get out of that rut. Yeah. And become a winner, you know? Yeah. You can get really spiraled down that yes. path. I mean, and you're, I'm thinking about you in that courtroom, just surrounded by um, white people and just feeling like you're a little bit different than everybody else in the room and imagining, but, you know, wanting to confirm with you with clarity here, um, as far as the respect factor, how were you treated in that scenario? Well, you know, just as a child and, just, uh, you know, you're, you're pretty much, you know, you're ignored and, and you're not even talked about. You're talked about in the third person, the defendant person, the yeah. child, the juvenile we'll adjudicate him. So that in itself sort of, um, you know, one of the things that, that ever happens when it comes to uh, a population feeling or uh, feeling under attack is a lot of times they're labeled, right? The ability to label and to paint the picture to other people about a segment or a population is a lot of power. Yeah. And then those people start believing that. So and group them together, right? And group them together. Exactly. Yeah. So for me, I would say that honestly, um, um, you know, looking at that and looking at that environment. Cause I, even growing up, I mean, I had white friends. I had people in my life that was white, but it just seemed like I never, ever, ever belonged hmm. and that I could never get ahead. And we couldn't get ahead as even as a family. I mean, like I said, my dad, he, he worked a lot of jobs, but you know, I mean, he, he did some junking. He did this, he did that. He yeah. always had the, you know, the, uh, yeah, he always had something going on, Yeah, but he was always there. He raised us out of my neighborhood. Um, you know, I was one of the few people that actually had um, fathers that was, you know, still in the home. But uh-huh. yeah, we're talking about race. And I want to ask about how racial inequalities show up in prison. Uh, can you talk about that with us, Jeff, and help us understand that? The first thing I want to before we even go into that, let's just talk about how it's set up. And I think I already did okay. a little bit where I discussed the sort of how the setup is when you go and you get arrested and you got the courtroom, you got the bailiff and yeah. you're already feeling like it's, man, this is, um, this is a us versus them sort of uh, environment. So then what you have is you have the jailers, mm-hmm. um, but then you have prisons. Prisons are normally situated in rural white neighborhoods or uh, cities and towns. Right. Uh-huh. So the, the, the person that could have been a farmer today is now, given complete uh, civil immunity um, tomorrow after he passes the civil service exam. And what you have is you have someone who's never really been around someone who looks like you. We just heard about you and every interaction actually is, uh, has been negative or it's been, this has been that. Mm. So let's just look at that in itself. And before we even talk about prison in every state, you have a place where juveniles go that is for the so-called worst of the worst. And, and I was no different. Yeah. So that place is situated in a very large rural white environment where the only time they come around uh, anyone black is through that particular program and that facility. Mm-hmm. So, and I can remember mm-hmm. even in that environment, when I got sent there waving at someone and them saying it was a gang sign. Then I got placed in solitary confinement at age 14 for about, at that point in my life, I had never been in nothing uh, like that. And I want to say uh, I spent about a week in there of, of, <clears throat> of basically, I, I got placed mm-hmm. in there. I was in a room. There was nothing in there. Couldn't sleep or they got days added on. Mm-hmm. And um, 
And so that's what sets it up for what you sort of are going to deal with, because at that point, 99% of the staff administration of that facility is white and yeah. rural. And about 40 to 45% of the, of the residents are all black from all over the state. Right. And mm-hmm. again, that's pretty much in any state you have that. So we have that set up there. Right. So we kind of already know mm-hmm. that this sort of becomes the welfare that's not called welfare for rural um, um, cities and towns. OK, this is where people mm-hmm. sort of uh, campaign and, and they can they say, hey, come to our town, build your prison here. Uh-huh. Um, and then what you have is and this goes a little bit into the, the paper I did. And with my master's program mm-hmm. of importation versus deprivation, mm-hmm. do we import the violence or do you deprive people so much of their humanity and their and human qualities that they feel like they have to be violent? So, right. Like, do they come in with it yes. or does it happen to them because of what happens? Exactly. Mm-hmm. So then I went to uh, my first prison I went to. Um, I can remember people talking about how racist it was and how awful it was. And I remember that in the city of Dubuque, Iowa, and it was actually on Gerardo, the Klan went there in March. Okay. Uh, mm. And then that's actually the facility that I was, was with some other prisoners. And that's where I heard that term, the Institute of White America, because a gentleman had made a, a rap about it and that was the name of it. And so okay. I was, um, everybody talked about the fact that when the, when the, 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 the Klan was marching in Dubuque. Yeah. There was very few staff working that day, and so oh. we had we had we had mm. at that point we had some guards that would shave their mustaches in a particular way, yeah, you know, that made them look a little bit like Hitler, shave their heads that way, mm. and um and there was just lots of um at that particular pro uh, facility, um the cultural idea sensitivity understanding yeah um you know it, that was non-existent um and okay just to get into the 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 horrors of that particular prison at that time, um, cultural and racial sensitivity um, is low on the scale, just to maintain a level of human quality amongst all races with uh, the guards that were working there at that time was something that was, that was hard to, uh, to even come by. So but no yeah, dignity. No, nobody was really given much dignity or respect. No, no. As a matter of fact, I can remember, um, um, I can remember that, I was uh, placed in solitary confinement there as an adult. I, you know, I was, I was waived to adult court as a juvenile. Again, the majority of people that I would see that were waived to adult courts were, were mm-hmm. Black youth because there's a study out that shows and, and demonstrates the fact that people see young Black uh, kids as older than what they really are. Uh-huh. And so it's much easier to put us in the prison at a younger age. And so I can remember going to... Uh, when I went to that prison, it wasn't long, I think within 20 or 30 days, um, I ended up going to, um, I got placed in the hole. And so I remember when they came to approach me, we get into a physical altercation. And then, and this is, again, I'm, I'm, I had just turned 17. They, they, um, they, they tackled me, they took me up the stairs and they put me in this, it looked like a closet. Like this looked like a, just a, a bare room. And, yeah. um, and, um, they put me in there, they cut all my clothes off, and then they took a taser, put it in my face and said, we just want you to move because we want to shock you. Mm-hmm. So when again, I was in that, when I was again, in that particular part yeah. of the hole, huh? Again, you had that, you know, sort of like that threat, some like a totally unequal fight. Somebody had a weapon and they were taunting you. Multiple, them, multiple. Yeah. Yeah. This is like with the pit, with the gun earlier, you said that happened. And so. This is a repeated experience that you've had. Acute, repeated, yeah, constant. Yeah, I just want to highlight constant. that. Yeah, repeated, and, not one yeah. time. And so, it, uh, and so I remember after I spent about, uh, I'd say, a week in there, and they would let me know that they were spitting in my food and, and things like that. So I didn't eat, right? Hmm. And so by the time they put me, now this is what I thought was the hole. They put me in the regular hole after that, okay? Yeah. And when I started talking to people that was in the hole there, they're like, where were you at? I said, I was the hole that they had never even heard of it. So they were put, they had oh. put me someplace that no one even, even knew about. Off None the, the map. Yeah. Off the map. So then huh. I found out that as other prisoners came in, um, there was something that had happened. And so some of the black prisoners wrapped, they had their hair in braids and they cut their, they cut their, 
Wow. And they pulled, they pulled the hair out um, of their hair versus, um, you know, to get the rubber bands out because they felt mm-hmm. like it was a security threat. So that in itself just says something mm-hmm. right there. But that was it at does. the first mm-hmm. um, facility that I was at. And it was definitely one of the most um, racist um, environments I had. I had That was hourly racist. A lot of places, you know, it wasn't so obvious growing up. You can break the barriers of mental health. Given Hour's mission is to provide help and hope to those in need. As of 2021, Given Hour's volunteer network of mental health providers has delivered over 360,000 hours of barrier-free, no-cost mental health care. With a small gift of $5, you can give help and hope. Your generosity will allow Given Hour to deliver confidential mental health services and vital education tools. Thank you for your support, because mental health is just as important as our physical health. Visit www.givenhour.org to learn more or to donate. You mentioned to me before in some of our past conversations about a physical altercation you had with a correctional officer that ended up, you went to the hole, and then you had an interaction with him many years later where he apologized to you. Is that what we're talking about or is that a different situation? No, no, I had, um, I had multiple uh, situations where we got it, where I had confrontations with correction officers. Um, uh-huh. But we can get into that later on because that actually, um, that was actually, um, I don't want to say my second year in solitary confinement. Hmm. And, and cause I spent a total of four years all together. That was in going solitary. My, in solitary confinement, six years all together in prison. And that was toward the second year because and we'll get into that if you want to get into it now. We can talk about other things, but but that actually was in my going into my second year or third year, and uh, yeah, my second year, and and then they placed me in the um, supermax um, for about a year, and then that's where mm-hmm. I sustained probably the most um, I call it torture that I have ever occurred. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I I'd call it torture too. What you're describing. Yeah. Living for, you know, four years of your life in solitary confinement, having people, you know, taunt you to. Yeah. Yeah. Torture is a good word. Well, for that year that I was in Supermax, that was a whole nother level of, of torture that involved um, placing us in uh, a 48 cell unit. And only 10 of us were um, were um were saying and the other 38 were mentally ill. So what they would, that, that's a whole nother thing. And actually that is something where I can um, forward you on sort of the lawsuit um, that we had to file in order to even get out of that environment because of, of the lack of mental health services that was going on with mm-hmm. those, um, those other prisoners and how they were being used as tools um, to, um, mm. to attack and torture us other 10 that all had co- um, assaults against correctional officers. Okay. So, but that's that's later on. But yeah, um, but the first situation I had, that was one where it was really um, that introduced me to what I was going to be dealing with um, the, for the next six years of my life. Yeah, let's talk about that. When you had that um, altercation with the correctional officer and then years later, you connected mm-hmm. again with him. Right. So let me. OK, so. Um, let me start off by saying. And that particular time, I had I was already in solitary confinement, okay, and and so at that and they call it administrative segregation, but um, it's the same thing. A lot of times we use different words to make things look more pretty and sound less um, um, or become more sterile, you know, than it really is. Um, yeah. And so um, one thing we haven't gotten into is just the racial politics because this actually goes into that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Let's go um, there. Okay, so we'll jump back a little bit to sure. how the race um, politics is sort of played, at least in that particular state prison system, because every state is different. You're in, you're in, um, in your state, I don't know if you want to say it or not, but in your state, it's definitely different than mine. And if East Coast is different than West Coast, Midwest, depending on what yeah. part of Midwest, state is different than federal. So all I really have the ability to discuss is how it is in um in my particular state that I so was we're at, talking right? about Iowa, not in California, Iowa, no. not New York. No, we're talking about um, Iowa. 
Yeah, because it's completely. Um, so I was a hybrid, okay, mm-hmm. of just so many different things. So when you, when I went into prison again, like I said, I we we dealt with race stuff, like in the juvenile facilities. We just you know we dealt with a little bit of race stuff, you know, in the um, even in school we dealt with a lot of different race things, but. Prison is where it took on a whole nother life of its own. And I can remember that even though I knew somebody who was who was white, um, I learned real quick that I was not going to be eating with them. I wasn't going to be talking with them um, in that extent. You know, I mean, we said hi and bye and all that. But the way it worked is that, you know, you sit with your own race, mm-hmm. um, you um, and within your race, you, you sit with your own different, maybe if you're involved in different street organizations and then amongst the, the whites, they sit amongst themselves and they. It's like racial segregation for your own protection. It is, but it's also, there's another element to this, which is um, this, it also keeps uh, prisoners under control because if you mm. start focusing on the administration a little bit, um, then, you know, then, it, then, then that yeah. can create a lot of problems as well. Gotcha. So. The idea of racial um, segregation in prisons, it, it, you know, when, they, when we talk about it, a lot of times it's going to be purported to be um, race. Okay. Um, it's it's going to be prisoner um, led. That's what they what it said. But it's actually something where it could be at times. But for the most part, there's a vested interest on the prison administration's part to make sure that keep you, you focused know, on each other. Right. And so, and and you know, and we'll get a little bit more into sort of how that those dirty politics on the prison administration's part, you know, can influence a lot of bad things. But, um, but um, the ideal is that, you know, if you, if you're into a, for example, if, if it doesn't matter what group you're in, what gang you're in or whatever organization you're in, mm-hmm. if you are black and you see another black person fighting a white person, um, if, if you, the only way you cannot jump in is if he's winning, but then for the white race, if there's another white person around, the only way that uh-huh. they can not jump in is if the white person's winning. Okay. So that tells you right then and there, that means that somebody's jumping in because somebody's losing. Yeah. And so on top of that, you have um, who you work out with. Um, and it's, it's based on race. Um, and again, these racial politics are more hardened depending on different different prison systems you're in. But in Iowa, it's 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 a clear line, and this is what the okay. expectation is, and people violate it. Um, but to get what they call that subgroup of good convict standing, you 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 play the politics the right way, mm-hmm. and so um, so yeah, so that in itself just says everything. So fast forward to being in the hole. Okay. Um, on my second year, I uh, as we come out. Okay, so. They are required to exercise us at that time, five days a week. And you go out into these big, probably about 50 foot long, I call them dog runs. They have barbed wire on top. Uh-huh. Um, sometimes they had clothes some in because, and then, and they're probably about 10 feet across. So about 10 by 50, maybe a little longer than that. And, and people just, and you know, they usually put about four prisoners in there at a time. Okay, it's the it's one of the large ones. And so they come out and then they just exercise back and forth, right? Okay. And then you use that time to talk to other people through the fences. And you're you're, you know, when you come out, you're handcuffed. You know, when you're strip searched, every time you go somewhere when you're in solitary confinement, um, for those years I was uh in this, I was strip searched. And that involves, you know, everything that you can think of that goes into strip searching. And then But how would you goal? be able to get anything on your person? Like what what's the rationale yeah. for that? Is well, that just about dignity or? Um, well, actually, um, it's about it's about dignity. Um, that That's a byproduct. But in all honesty, the story I'm going to get into next is going to explain that that doesn't really matter that much. OK, um, because one of the things about having prisons in rural areas is you have sympathizers to sort of the rate, the, mm, the, the okay. white the supremacist organizations and groups. Right. So okay. if you're a sympathizer and you know that. And you may look the other way, or if you're a, if you're a, somebody who really doesn't want to do their job or whatever, you know, you kind of like, I kind of know, you know, who's going to search you. And even if they do search you, you can still get it out. Mm-hmm. All right. There's a lot of different ways. So, um, and, and so I'm going out and there's four of us into one of those, uh, I call them again, dog runs. Okay. 
and we're walking back and forth. It's around June. And, um, and I can remember while we're walking back and forth, I could already, you know, when you're in prison, you already know something's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so I already knew something was going to happen. I didn't know where or where it was going to come from, but I could feel it. You develop that, that sixth sense. Yeah. And so I look up and I can see some quick movement. And one of the white uh, prisoners is stabbing one of the Hispanic prisoners. And there's another white prisoner in there. Right. Uh-huh. And so in order for them to come in and stop this stabbing, um, they are required to have us cuff up and have us, um, you know, come out and then they'll go in, right? Right. And so they're at the top of the end, sort of, he's, you know, the person's getting cut, stabbed. And then there's the white guy and then there's me. The white guy that's in there with me is doing a life sentence. And um, I know he's, a, I know who he's connected with. I mean, you just got to assume every, you know, they're all, yeah. that's just part of survival. You know, a lot of these people aren't mm-hmm. racist either way, but they are when they go under, you got to survive. And so, mm-hmm. um, but the guard comes up to me and says, hey, ball is cuff up. Now, at this point, I have to make a split decision. I can either cuff up and then he can turn mm-hmm. on me and pull out a knife and he mm-hmm. can get, and they, and the white prisoners can get two for one, basically. They get a Hispanic and they get a black. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just wasn't having it at that point. But when I just, when I say, no, I'm not cuffing up today. And I step back and I look at the dude and they tell him to cuff up and he cuffs up. But at that point, I can't cuff up no more uh-huh. because that's a matter of dignity, respect. You've already and, put your line in the sand. Yeah, I already drew my line in the sand. I already decided this is how I was going to move. Because when I was in there, I moved a particular way. And I had decided that no matter what, there's going to be things that I wasn't going to do and was going to do. And um, that's what I was, that's how I was trained in prison, you know, um, in general by some of the older prisoners is that, you know, you, you never go back on your word. Okay. Um, you never, um, you know, when you say something, you do it no matter what. And so right. that's why a lot of people who have been in prison, when you meet them, if they give you your word, their word, I mean, more mm-hmm. likely than not, they're going to stand by it. But mm-hmm. So anyways, so at that point, I can't cuff up. And so the, the emergency response team, the certified emergency response team or the riot team, at that point, they're in, you know, they're in fatigues, boots. Uh, they got tapes, they got all that stuff. And then they're, they're gassing or, 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 or um, macing the two that are the person that's stabbing and the other person getting stabbed. Other person got cuffed up. He's walking out. And I step back. And I know that I just got to get as many as I can, because if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it the right way. And so as they bulldoze down, probably about 10 of them. Um, and at that time, you know, I had prepared for every physical situation. You always prepare for it. Working out, mental, you never hesitate. And so when they came in, I just went right to work with physical um, violence. And, and, I, and, I, and I punched a kick and I grabbed. But of course, Mm-hmm. They overwhelm me and um and they basically um drag me out. Um they get their they get their licks in, meaning mm-hmm. I had you know, the, this is the top tier team. So the idea that they were assaulted by one person when they came in. Yeah. And not only did I do, you know, assault one, but I assaulted a few of them. Um they needed to show and demonstrate in their mind that you can't do this. So then uh-huh. They got their guy back, which I was expecting. Okay. Um, and I, you know, it's just part of what it is. And then yeah. they take me over and, and act like they're taking me to the, you know, the firm to be looked at, but it's just another opportunity to drag me, put the cuffs tight, makes me some more. And then they take me and put me in the supermax, um, where I spent a year at that point of, um, and, and well, as a result of me assaulting the correctional officers, mm-hmm. um, they put me on cert escort. So what that meant was the only people that can come get me and take me out of my cell, strip search me, was going to be the same people that I assaulted, uh. um, the, the, the riot team. So a lot of yeah. times um, they would come and they would get me um, four in the morning because they didn't want no one else to see me. They wanted people to believe that... Um, uh, that I had, you know, I was beat really bad and stuff like that. And I wasn't, you know, 
Okay. Um, but they got their licks in. They made sure they, they got it in. But they also knew at some point that because I had cured myself a certain way, that if they did go overboard, that I would respond one way or another. Yeah. And so, and I'm not saying that they were terrified of me. And actually, I attributed to one of my mentors who, who they knew I was connected with. It actually had a conversation with one of them. And that gentleman was doing um, um, a lot. He was doing a, um, a double life sentence. And, um, and, and, you know, and they knew that there was a, he didn't have any reservations that we were connected. And yeah. at some point, you know what? They did come in. They did threaten me a few different times. They would come in on a Monday, say, get ready for a shower at four in the morning. And they would never come back for about, I don't know, the Friday. And so a lot of that stuff happened. I didn't eat a lot of their food. And then the thing that they did the most was, um, you know, they would, um, you have, um, they were given the, the mentally ill prisoner cigarettes. They're banging and yelling. That's what I hear for a year straight. Banging, yelling all day, all night. Mm. Um, lots that of, is a form of torture. Yeah, it's in sensory deprivation. It was just mm-hmm. tons of stuff that was just going on. Or they, just the idea that you could be eating something that has nothing but is full of their spit or their yeah. urine or whatever because they would, you'd hear them say that. Or they would laugh about, I mean, they would do things like, um, you know, get the mentally ill prisoners going flood sales. I mean, it was, you know, and, and they did that with me, but I was one of the ones, even though I had assaulted some of them, I mean, there was other ones in there that had been driven to assault them much worse than I did. And they were getting the whole lot worse. We were all getting it, you know? Mm. And so we stayed, I only stayed in there for a year and then we eventually filed a lawsuit because one of the things I started doing was learning about the law. And so eventually this is a combination of black and white prisoners. We filed a class action. And as a result, they had to um, they had to take us out of the supermax and they had to build a new mental health facility. Huh. And so I had so much time in the hole wow. at that point that um, it was going extended beyond my uh, my prison term. So at that point, I was supposed to discharge my prison sentence from solitary confinement. But because of the lawsuit, they had to redesign. Wow. Um, how they did whole time. And so I'll, I'll see that. It's about a, and you can read some of the testimonies of some of the prisoners that, that you know, cause I, I mean, I'm, I can remember smelling people burning their flesh. You had people that would, you know, eat, eat their own feces. I mean, everything you can imagine a human being could do to themselves or other people. I mean, every smell you can imagine. Uh-huh. Um, I can remember a gentleman. Um, he, uh, he went to the shower after somebody and the guy had packed the shower head full of feces so that when he turned it on, mm-hmm. it just came on. I mean, because this is truly solitary confinement. And so you end up having these mentally ill prisoners a lot of times. And they knew that no one, you know, that yeah. a lot of times in prison, what, what makes someone survive in prison and be respected, honestly, yeah, is honestly. that their willingness to commit violence. If you think I can commit more violence than you, yeah. I have a hand over on you. Mm-hmm. And if I'm willing to commit the violence and you see me do it, mm-hmm. um, then you're going to you're going to be in line. But if you're mm-hmm. somebody where, you know, you'll never, ever be around nobody. You're already mentally ill. And we would call them bugs. And, and because mm-hmm. they were they were. And all I can remember is just saying to myself, no matter what I did. Yeah. No matter what happened to me, I would maintain my sanity. I wouldn't be amongst the broken men. And I would walk out of there with my full sanity. And, and I think that's when I started imagining to myself that I had created my own family because for the entire time I was in there, I never saw my family. And I remember having all my birthdays in solitary confinement, including my 18th birthday. And I remember thinking to myself, did I just dream them up? Do they not exist? Mm-hmm. So I want to say mm-hmm. that, you know, I'd like to thank a little bit that, you know, I was trying to maintain my dignity and my sanity. And for the most part, I think I did. But at some point, you know, when I started thinking that, that I look back on that and say, was that the time that, um, you yeah. know, that I was, you know, who knows what, but what helped you, what helped you maintain your, your sanity um, in that environment? Um, uh, you know what, um, I developed inner strength that I've never in my life thought I could have. Mm. Um, but I, um, inner strength, um, inwardly, just how, knowing that how did you develop that? Like what you was know, it? When that... you, yeah. I, I explain when you know, in life, there's, there's no choice, but up. Yeah. And you'll go up or yeah. you'll go down. And for me, mm. I kept saying to myself, you know, I may feel like I've been forsaken by people or whatever, thrown away since I was because I was in 
one place or another since I was 14. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was not going to walk out of there um, bugging out. I was not going to walk out. So I dug in deep. There's places that you can go in your mind and your heart that some people don't realize they can go to. But when you have no other place to go but inward to find yourself, you'll find yourself. And for me, inwardly, that's what I did. And then externally, when we had opportunities, we would get in events and we would talk to each other. We would, uh, we would actually start building our vocabulary better. So we would give each other five vocabulary words. And then we'll give the next person. And everyone would talk about it, study those. Whenever we could get in there, because remember, when we got events, a lot of times the, the mentally ill persons would get in there, start banging and yelling and screaming. Yeah. So um, chess, um, that's where I played a lot of chess at. And, um, and reading as much as I could, um, developing my character, working out. Those are the things I did externally, but you got to remember and understand that I'm also, at that time, I'm, I'm really focused on um, George Jackson, um, Blood of My Eye. I'm really focused on um, um, Miles St. Tongue. I'm really focused on, um, mm. um, I'm reading everything you can think of, and I'm reading about people who are going through trials and tribulations, including mm. uh, Che Guevara, and about what they did to survive. So I just made it a point that everything that I found mm. peace in, was yeah. not going to be external. It was going to be internal. So if they decide they don't want to, that they want to feed me food that um, they may have peed in or whatever. Yeah. I just won't eat the food. So there'll be times where I just wouldn't eat for like three or four or five days or a week. Mm-hmm. Or maybe, and just to push my body. And, and a lot of us, when we get together, a lot of the comrades, we say, you know what? You know what? Let's see how far we can go. Maybe huh. we don't drink water for 24 hours. Maybe we stay up for 48 hours. And, you know, the key is that you push yourself so you start being able to really dig in and find out who you really are. Because, again, remember I told you in the beginning that I found out about a lot of those people that came out when I was younger? Yes. I found out that they wasn't as tough as they thought, um, that I thought growing up. I found out Mm. that they wasn't doing it the way I thought they were doing it, the way I was doing it, actually. And so I'm doing 11 years in a place that most people are doing 85 years to, to life sentences. Mm. And I'm finding more time in the hole than um, I can ever imagine. So I started finding out that these people aren't. And so I stopped looking up to them. Okay. And I started realizing that the, the hero, uh, that no one's coming for me. There's no Superman. No yeah. one's going to swoop in in the middle of the night and arrest me out of that, that cell of that banging and screaming and yelling. Yeah. Nothing is going to happen. I got to find a superhero myself. So um, so I found everything that brought me peace and tranquility yeah. um, through um, internal mechanisms. And it's once really we do that, interesting. Yeah. And, and once we do that, there's nothing that no one can ever take from you. can't you. take it from I, you. No, and that's what I wanted. I yeah. quit smoking cigarettes when I was uh, 19. And that mm-hmm. was one of the best things I did because I realized mm-hmm. that was something that I would watch people who didn't want any real freedom. That would be enough for them to to live a life in my mind at that point where mm. it was just totally next to nothing. Cause I was determined that even if mm-hmm. I'm in prison, I'm still going to be a man. Even if I'm in prison, I'm still going to be so somebody. That self-command right. was, was part of how you learned to respect yourself. Absolutely. And I realized that, that the people that I thought were strong, yeah, the people that I thought that were, um, that were there for me, um, it was just in words but the only, the only thing that's, that's really consistent in life is change. So I needed to understand that in order for me to, uh, to understand change, I needed to master change and change me and myself. So I got to make something that's nothing into something that's a little bit more powerful. And that rent for that is due every day. And yep. every day that I get up, I commit to that even to this day. Let's go. We have to wrap up and I wish okay. we could have, you know, five episodes with you. <laughs> oh, this <laughs> is so good. But I want to have that conversation about the interaction you had later with that correctional yes. officer, because that was really interesting. Can you share that other part of the story that came years later, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, so now um, I call myself the reformed social worker, and there's a reason why. And I, there's a play on words. It's not about being reformed. It's about reforming myself. Mm-hmm. And so my whole life, it's about understanding and valuing that, that um, life is about transformational change. So I needed to change myself and how I thought about myself and other people, including 
um, the idea that the people that were in my situation as a kid, as an adult, I needed to get out there and work with them. And that's what I do now. And so as a part of this, I ended up reaching out to um, to a, the a warden of the one of the penitentiaries that I was at, and I and I knew they had closed it, and I had a, and I said to her, I said, "Hey, could I come out?" And I know that um, you know it's closed. But I just want to come. I want to just know that this place was real, that I actually was there, right? And so I went out there, and I and and so she's like, "Okay, we we can check into that. Let's meet." So even though, you know, I, I do a lot of different things now, you know, we still wanted to meet, we met. And when she comes up, she says, um, she says, you know, I brought somebody with me and, um, and I'm looking and I'm, and I'm, I'm at that point, I'm, I'm thinking, I know who he is, but I, I'm not sure. And he says, you know, we're talking a little bit. He's like, you know what? You, you don't remember me. And, and do we, you know, I'm trying to remember if I remember you and we get to talk and he realizes that it's this, I was the one that he was part of that whole team that, you know, that I had solved. Right, and team. He, yeah. yeah. And then he, he apologized. And um, I said, man, you know, and at the end of the day, you were doing what you were doing. I was doing what I was doing. You know, what we need to really be worrying about is what we can do to make situations like that not happen, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, um, but he apologized for, for what happened after that, which was the, the assaults that they, they committed on me after they had subdued me and he knew um that uh that he was wrong for that but again we're both on opposing teams so they do what they do i do what i do and and so i told him you know i appreciate it you know and for what i did i didn't want it to you know i didn't want it to be like that but and we talked about that and so i think that that was uh and so we talked about the idea that i would then Let's try to collaborate so we can start working together to sort of talk to um, young correction officers and their training so they can understand what goes into building a healthy relationship with someone that you have power over to really ruin their day and their years, you know? And, um, and so, you know, and then not too long after that, the pandemic hit, but um, currently I will be, I'm actually going to be presenting at um, one of the uh, correctional uh, conferences and, and I think from there, I've been collaborating with some other people to sort of work with them, uh, with them, and hopefully that'll come up because I think our ability to shape the minds of the people that are going to be working in these fields is huge. Whose so. team are you on now? I'm on humanities team. Right, right? on. That's what I was gonna. That's what I was <laughs> and, gonna um, say, but I wanted you to say it. <laughs> yeah, I'm on. I'm on a team of humanity. At the end of the day, yeah. um, we all That's got our team now. Yeah, we got. Yep. And, you know, we all got pushed in different places, you know, in this in this world when we were probably sometimes at our worst. I've seen the ugliest of what humans can do. Yep. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I can remember listening one night to a guy. Just that's all I heard all night if he was. Um, as he was sharpening his uh, his what we call a tool. Mm-hmm. And as the correction officer came around, I could watch through the window. As he um, did what he what he needed to what he thought he needed to do because of what the correction officer had said to him, um, mm-hmm. which was called him um, a rat, which is something you just don't do. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but I remember just thinking to myself, who would, who can imagine watching this do the the reflection of the window as he gets stabbed and blood gets spurting out? Yeah, and you know, so I've seen what what he knew what was going to happen when he said it and he knew what he needed to do when it was said to him, how do we get to that place in, 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 a, in our world? Mm-hmm. You know? So I've seen the worst of humanity for yes, them to have. spend to our food. I, well, I, I know for a fact that they would take some people who didn't have the ability to retaliate the mentally ill prisoners and stuff their head and toilets after defecating in them. You know, I, I, I've seen the worst. And, mm-hmm. um, and I think that, but I've seen the best too, because I've seen people who've given me a chance and an opportunity when a lot of people wouldn't. And yeah. I've made that worth it and not allow it to be a reason yeah. also that people hold it over me either. It's like, once you give me an opportunity, you can't keep holding it over me because a lot of times that will happen, you know? 
Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. So that's yeah, not so. as easy though, if you respect yourself, you know, like yes. that's something right. That's critical. There, it's like, it's absolutely critical. You, you got to know transmit your nose. that. You got to know your nose. You got to know your, let your nays be your nays and your yays be your yays. Yeah. And that's something, you know, that you said is very common for people who have been incarcerated is they give you their word and mm-hmm. they will keep it. Um, you know, so it's not, not all bad, uh, what you learned yeah. and, Oh, no, no. I, I became a man you know? in prison, actually. Um, yeah. And what, what actually I got trained in and my ability was to learn how to, to outthink my opponent versus how to outfight them physically. As I say a lot, I learned how to fight wars without wars without ever picking up a sword. It's kind of like that's the so key, I right? learned how to think and how to to yep. be um, how to tap into that and to stop being violent and to see the value in everybody and the strength in everybody. I found that in the darkest, dirtiest place in the world. That's and it. Minute, that's that's what I'm trying to say. It's like yeah. this is a story of trauma, yeah. but this is not a sob story. Like no. this is actually a story of post-traumatic growth, as well as how you've suffered and you know the places that very, very dark valleys that you have found yourself in for yeah. so many years of your life, but you yeah. didn't come out of it saying, "No, I'm going to be you know us versus them or all about myself." Um, you're on humanities team now and I, I can, I can hear it and I can see it in you and I appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there's, I will say that you hear about the word, the hate that hate made. And I had a choice at some point yeah. and, and you know, of being, of being consumed by that hate. Mm-hmm. I was for a while where, and I'm not mm-hmm. talking about race. I'm just talking about sure. the ideal of, I was getting ready to war. I was a warrior in the middle of a battle. Yep. And um, everything I did was about getting ready for the final countdown. I started operating and I was never getting out of prison, um, Doc. And you know what? I was only doing 11 years. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, so I chose, I chose life. And when I did get out, it was, it was a day that it was a struggle because people get out and I knew what I had to deal with. I knew what I had watched other people do and they kept coming back and, I knew what I needed to do different. And I, you know, it wasn't as easy as I thought and it was difficult, but I, I triumphed and I realized that part of not being counted amongst the broken men for me was also not coming back. Okay. Okay. So, but yeah, absolutely. Well, I feel like there's again, so much more that we could get into and, you know, maybe in a, a few months, I'll see what your availability might be to have yeah. a follow-up conversation on recidivism. Yes, because we didn't get to that, and I wanted your thoughts on that. And I've already, I've already got to do the impossible job of editing this (laughs) conversation, Jeff. So um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. I know. We we, we talked a lot. It's my favorite kind of problem to have. Um, (laughs) I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out because this is really important, and your story is um, deeply inspiring and full of insight. So, um, so good. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing from your heart and your spirit with all of us and your insights. I really appreciate it. Thank you to Jeff for sharing his story and his personal calling with us. Jeff understands that trauma can considerably change the direction of a youth's life. and He's driven to change the way youthful offenders are sentenced so they can find their true path. Thank you for bringing your journey to us. We're so glad you did. Post-traumatic stress is not a life sentence. Trauma can be healed with the right insights, the right treatments, and the right support. The story of our trauma is presented by Stella. Visit www.stellacenter.com to learn more about Stella's breakthrough trauma treatments. Please share this episode with people you care about who have been impacted by trauma. And remember to subscribe on Spotify and other streaming platforms.